to do. Her mother had been a beauty, a green-eyed blonde who wore a long braid down her back in high school and then college, Vassar 57, in New York, Katie Gibbs 58, and her job in the typing pool at Westinghouse before she was asked, actually told, to adopt the more stylish updos of the time. She refused, her boss accusing her of hysteria, though the origin of the word, do you know this, is the once belief that the uterus could reach up its bloody hands and grip the throat. Constance addresses the mostly silent women, many from her department, who have gathered in the Antlers Bar on Elm, near the Loop, for the new Storytelling Wednesdays. The audience is silence, not silence, but agitated, bored distraction, as Constance closes with a recitation of her mother's to-do list. One of the many she found among her mother's things last spring, upon her passing, she's explained. Cirrhosis of the liver, but that's another story. This list was picked at random at a, from a drawer in the condo's kitchenette, her mother in one of those retirement communities haunted by women and men at the end stage. Although whoever saw the men? The men were parked in different hallways, narrow wallpapered corridors lined with orchids, Constance says. Miles and miles of orchids, she continues. The wallpapers, the walls hung with Wyeth and Rockwell and Turner prints, the corridors labyrinthine, windowless. I was always lost, she tells the silent women. They gave me three weeks to clear everything out. Presto pronto, goodwill, hello. No condolences from the staff. And these lists everywhere, on the backs of envelopes and cardboard coasters, pharmaceutical notepads, post-its in different colors, and scraps of watercolor paper. She likes to paint, liked to paint. And anyway, everything, so much to do, lists and lists. The crowd's silence is the same weight she senses in class sometimes when she wanders to a different topic or at a dinner table when she's had too much wine. I call it, she says, clearing her throat, to do. She adds, I hope everyone will get the picture as someone scrapes her chair back and angles towards the bathroom. The others watch the woman's progress, riveted. <laughs> a few performers later, Beth, Constance's colleague, stands bare-chested, center stage, spoons balanced on her nipples. Her medium is sensually visual, she had said by way of introduction. We could do it at football parties, it's a thing. And here, a visual reimagining of my lost youth, she concluded, unbuttoning. Now, she kills the same crowd, the women wildly applauding as Beth looks up, her face flushed even from this distance, or perhaps it's the lights. They flood the makeshift stage. They flood Beth, the glare of them casting her as something other, something more. Is she wearing face paint? Has she grown a third eye? One silver spoon drops to the floor, and the crowd collectively gasps. <laughs> Her mother's to-do list went something like this. Bleach, yarn, Q-tips, blueberries, call Constance, organize girls, ask William. Constance had read each item slowly, deliberately, clarifying a few details. William, her mother's ex-husband, Constance's father, long deceased. Girls, she and her younger sister Sally, she supposed. All the while on stage thinking, what was I thinking? What was I thinking? Her performance had lasted no more than a few minutes, but the weight solidified into a rock you might split open with a hammer and chisel. It, it all had to do with saying something, Constance told herself, with continuity and mothers, uh, lists and identity. In short, are we the sum of what we've crossed off, or are we only what we still have left to do? Her mother's death it wasn't the point. People died every week at that place, every day of the year. Mothers, fathers, in her mother's retirement community, they printed, embossed, the names of the newly dead on ivory cardstock each morning and propped the card as if it were a menu on a tiny easel outside the dining room. Dinner specials, her mother called them, death du jour. 
When Constance used to visit, which she'd done less often than she would like to admit, she steered her mother clear of the easel and wheeled her straight into the employee who manned the dining room door. We have a standing reservation, her mother would say, a joke, or coquettishly, table for two, and they would laugh and laugh. Now, Constance gestures to the waitress for another drink. She wants it quickly before the loudly applauded Beth returns from the stage, although Beth appears to be going nowhere, the audience whistling as if to summon dogs. Earlier, Beth had ordered a green tea and warm quinoa with kale, protein, and grains, she explained. And no to wine, thanks, no. One glass will make her fuzzy-headed in the morning, and Beth wants none of that. She's having none of that, apparently. <laughs> she had smiled. Sorry, she said, I'm a boring date. Where's camaraderie? Constance wants to know. What happened to camaraderie, to tonight's out, to bonding, to drunkenness? All these young women so lean and muscular and accomplished at 30. Ivy League, Brazilian waxed, thonged, tattooed. She pictures her little sister, Sally, thonged, tattooed, bending down to wipe the chin of one of her numerous children. Tattooed, Sally, Jesus. <laughs> Antlers is a university bar, odd for downtown, off the loop with its streets of neon pizza establishments and old Polish restaurants, marble floored, near embalmed waiters. Odd, so close to the lake, where on certain nights, such as this one, the wind tunnels down Sheridan, up oak, pummeling the grass, the glass-wrapped new condos, and bending the spindly sycamores planted in tree boxes on oak and willow and maple until they nearly snap. Here, Antler's many mullioned windows seem oblivious of weather. The glass plastered with peeling team mascots and political stickers, the walls dense with important persons in black and white, mostly already forgotten, their cap smiles wide and white, their hairstyles reflecting each decade, a visual medium. A severed head of an elk, the bar's inspiration, its dark eyes dulled, its fur patchy, and Antler's obscene, stares down from the end of the narrow hallway to the bathrooms. The bar decidedly male and unaccustomed to such a throng of females order the waft of estrogen rising like mist. Its makeshift stage, not a stage, exactly more a dais of the kind used for elevating politicians above a crowd. Look now at Beth as she takes another bow. All the colleagues reluctant to let her go as she waves goodbye to the left, goodbye to the right, Spoons in hand and blouse, fortunately buttoned up. Groups of women, some strangers, offer high five as she threads through the tables. Constance watches, then turns to Beth's quinoa, a hearty, fiber-esque gray. She pictures opening her mouth and blowing, setting the entire place to flame, or at least reheating the quinoa. <laughs> she could do it, too given what she's put down in the course of the past hour, given her general mood. A little fire would bring a swift end to storytelling Wednesdays. <laughs> We're all about inhibition, Mary Ann, the MC, recently tenured and flushed from the publication of a best-selling dystopian novel, announced at the start of the evening, losing it, or possibly creativity, gaining it, reclaiming it, owning it, she added. Her own story kicking things off, had to do with her firstborn, a cesarean section. The doctor's hands deep in her gut, a recurring feeling even after he'd sewn her up, even after her newborn was a toddler, those hands still there, rooting, rooting around. Amazing, Constance says to Beth, who slides with a jaunty handoff from Mary Ann back into her seat. You liked, Beth says, loved, completely loved, Insane. I mean, how did you even do that? Practice, Beth says. Muscle memory. Tim thinks it's a hoot. Beth holds two familiar-looking spoons in her hand. Your quinoa's cold, Constance says. I know, Beth says, scooping, chewing. It's supposed to be. Well, not cold exactly, but not hot. Hot is too much. Lukewarm is best. I completely agree, Constance says. <laughs> Another mother story, not that anyone's asking. A day long ago, summer of 80s or thereabouts, Constance, 
scrounging for spare change and possibly a cigarette in one of the cloisonne boxes in the living room. Constance is a teenager in tennis whites, a big match that afternoon. The living room is a room she rarely enters, sanctioned as it is for weekend gatherings of adults. They come in pairs like monogamous swans, arriving for her parents' famous cocktail parties, chit-chatting among the heavy walnut furniture, the coffee table with its twisted vined legs, the tiger oak sideboard laden with silver she and, po she and Sally polished the day before Thanksgiving or Christmas Eve. On the walls are the artifacts from her parents' collections, her mother's framed Hans Christian Andersen's illustrations. Her mother's framed Hans Christian Andersen illustrations torn from a valuable ancient edition of flea market steel, the little match girl shivering, and a near-dead Hansel and Gretel and splayed on the living room couch, one arm across her eyes as if against a glare, her mother out cold. No Constance has come into 13 like Juliet Capulet, lovesick, desperate, a pawn in the vagaries of jousting boys. She keeps a diary under lock and key and rarely tells anyone her true thoughts, how she alone can see the way the world tilts and slips off its axis, the way no one understands a thing but her. She feels in her bones she will reinvent the universe in the image of something better, something as of yet unimaginable, but far beyond the horizon of the failing world, of this failing world. She will, she believes, just as soon as she gets out. Now she loops her mother's arm over her shoulder and drags her up the stairs. Soon, the bridge group arrives, clustering in the foyer, bags and shoes, expressions. They are here for the weekly game, they, kept, they tell Constance, who has answered the door. They were on for 11, they say, and isn't that her mother's car still in the drive? Who knew? Who didn't? Constance's mother was once not so far from the rest of them, if measured by this and that, yardsticks or swizzle. But now... She has soared straight to space, shot to the moon, tucked into bed where Constance has lugged her. Mother's upstairs, Constance says. She's under the weather. It's going around, Margaret Jones says. I believe she knew we were coming, Florence Spears says. I told her I'd play her hand, Constance says, improvising. I'm not bad. I've been teaching myself. She's been teaching herself. Taffy Bott says, as if Constance were speaking French and she must translate for the rest of them. <laughs> Constance smiles and holds up the cards, tall in her tennis whites, her legs armed and tanned. She explains that they can play a rubber, maybe two, but she has a match in an hour and ha will have to cut it short. She has her mother's eyes they'd never noticed and a way of looking as if she might rip their throats. No doubt she has a killer serve. Sally arrives to offer lemonade, 10 cents a glass. All right, they say, if you're sure. They say, everything almost fine and what isn't can be ignored. Constance subbing for her mother. Little Sally selling lemonade. Florence Spears tells a funny story. Taffy Bott shows them her broken toe, the bruise reaching all the way to her calf. Margaret Jones has a summer cold, but who doesn't? Constance sets up the card table in the middle of the living room the folding one from the garage still sticky with the spills from Sally's stand the week before. She sends Sally for a tablecloth from the kitchen, cocktail napkins, a can of peanuts from the pantry. The women eat the nuts in fistfuls, down their drinks quickly. The, co the cocktail napkins read, of all the things I've loved and lost, I miss my mind the most. Beth walks Constance to her apartment one of the nondescript new condos on Sheridan near the university. They burrow against the wind in their puffy, ugly coats, too cold to speak until they reach the shelter of the courtyard. Would you like a nightcap? Constance asks. I've got midterms, Beth says. Right, Constance says, forgot, she says. A sabbatical haze, she adds, her explanation these days for everything. Well, good night, Constance says. 
pulling down the heavy door, outer door to the vestibule. You were great, she calls to Beth as the door slowly closes behind her. Within the vestibule, there are the usual takeout menus and free newspapers scattered on the tiled floor. And someone has once again covered the buzzer panel with stickers advertising a locksmith. Call Phil. The stickers read again and again. There must be a hundred of them, or hundreds. Phil, everywhere. Constance reaches into her pocket for her key, a single key, unadorned. She likes it that way, though her ex-husband Luke is convinced she's a fool. You're a fool, Luke tells her every time she fishes for her single key, silver key out of her pocket. A fool. But there's no key, only a piece of paper, a list, folded over and over again as if top secret. The ink faded, though clearly, her mother's hand. To do, it reads, bleach, yarn, Q-tips, blueberries? Call Constance, organize girls, ask William. What did I miss, her mother wants to know. She lies in bed, eating the buttered toast Constance has delivered on a tray. There are smells here, beyond the homey toast, her mother's smells. And the cold smell of the big black telephone next to the bed, where her mother and father sleep, lying straight and still, side by side. Her mother's clothes are lined in the closet by color. Her sweater zipped into moth-proof bags. And in the third drawer, behind the box with her mother's rings and pearls, the bottle of gin Constance found for foraging for cigarettes weeks earlier. She had swigged some for good measure, then poured most of it down the drain in the master bedroom, the counter cluttered with her mother's makeup and perfumes, the mirror smudged in places as if her mother had pressed her face too close to the glass. Nothing, Constance says. She has played her match, returning straight home. Somewhere between here and the club, she saw a flattened armadillo, armadillo, its splintered shell streaked with brown blood. Someone must have dragged it to the dirt. She stinks of dried sweat, dried to salt. If you licked her, you could survive for a while, but not forever. She has won her match in straight sets. In fact, the few onlookers, other girls' mothers, said they had never seen Constance serve so well. Constance playing as if her life depended on it. Her opponent, a taller, a taller older girl named Macy Levitt, her glasses hooked with a needlepoint band, though it thought at first that Constance wasn't Constance at all. That somehow in the time between now and before, Constance had been replaced with a different Constance. Not the Constance Macy Levitt knew from the past, but a Constance from some distant Amazonian tribe. So you're the famous Phil, Constance says. He, he's arrived, as promised, driving up in his big truck as if this were, this were the country, idling for a while, the truck's headlights illuminating her, casting glare and shadow on the glass door, the frozen courtyard, the wilted rhododendron. Yes, ma'am, Phil says, pulling out a ring of keys, a bowling ball of keys. Good to meet you, she says. Same. He says, Phil is stunningly handsome. She wouldn't have predicted it at all. But the world turns in mysterious ways, as her mother would have said. Her mother would have also said, there but for the grace of God go I. Hindsight is twenty twenty, and better than canned beer. <laughs> Ma'am, he says, she's been drifting apparently sabbatical haze. Yes, uh, done, he says. And she resists correcting his grammar, as she's inclined to do. A turkey is done, she might say to him. You are finished. <laughs> really? Wow. I mean, I wasn't exactly watching, but that was fast. Yes, ma'am. I'm glad you left your stickers all over the place. Yes, ma'am. The man was irritating, but the rest of him she liked. <laughs> she remembers the story of her friend from college who invited the UPS guy in. This was exciting back then. A man wearing a brown and yellow uniform on your doorstep, ringing your doorbell, goodies packed in large cardboard boxes. How about a drink, she asks Phil. Would you like a drink, a nightcap? I was just going up and, boy, you, you really saved my ass. 
no one answered the buzzer. The whole world is out. I mean, I have a cat and, and my son. Well, he's with his father tonight, but he would have totally freaked if I couldn't get in to feed the cat because it's his cat. Sure. What? Sure, I'll have a drink, Phil says. I've got coverage. Coverage. Great. Phil holds the vestibule door open for her and then follows Constance into the elevator and out onto the brightly lit floor. Lines of doors on either side of the long hallway, strangers within. It's Chicago real estate of a certain kind. Thin walls, thin glassed windows that leak heat in winter. The radiators blasting like nobody's business. Here, the little match girl looks entirely out of place. Constance has kept the print through college and graduate school. Its twin, Hansel and Gretel, lost to a moldy basement in Oakland, unrecoverable. It is very late when Constance finds herself naked from the waist up, attempting to balance spoons on her nipples. <laughs> Something we used to do at football parties, she lies, for the entertainment of the locksmith Phil, a man to whom she has already recited her mother's to-do list, hoping for a better reaction than the silence of Storytelling Wednesday. Phil had come through. He applauded heartily. You get it, she said. You get it? <laughs> they have finished the bottle found in the refrigerator. Their sex vigorous inspired, or what she remembers of it, the couch wide enough for both of them, though she preferred the floor. Now he watches the spoons, which she has after several attempts. Muscle memory, she explains. Finally mastered. They balance from her nipples like silver icicles, Neat trick, Phil says, buttoning up. I'll teach my wife. <laughs> Constance could eat Macy Levitt for lunch. She could pummel her with aces, lunge the net, drive the ball down her throat. She pictures it clearly. Think like a winner, her coach is saying. Her coach, a woman whose name has been engraved countless times on the trophies and glass outside the ladies' lounge. Baby Rollins, first place, ladies' singles. Baby Rollins, first place, club championship. Baby Rollins and Fran White, first place, etc., etc. She beats Macy Levitt in straight sets. She makes Macy Levitt cry. She makes Macy Levitt throw off her glasses and stomp them with her tree torns, losing the needlepoint band in the crabgrass next to the court. It's fine handiwork sucked up and shredded by the power mower a few days later. The driver entirely oblivious. She makes Macy Levitt quit the junior varsity team. And years later, when she learns that Macy Levitt has been hospitalized for anorexia, she wonders if she also made Macy Levitt do that. Constance reheats the coffee. She shuffles the stack of business cards Phil has left behind. What's with this guy? Outside, a bright moon, and far below the scurry of late-night students, home from the library, the clubs, other dorm rooms, the university is taking over this neighborhood, once a place of revolutionaries and poets, men and women who labored in the slaughterhouses, whose fathers and mothers escaped lives so unspeakable they never spoke of them. Their languages, their etymologies, submerged in the rising tide of English. Their customs obliterated, or at least that's what the public said when the public weighed in, person after person, waiting for her chance at the microphone. But no one listened. And here's another mother's story, the part Constance doesn't like to tell, the reason for all this mother business, why her mother is here again, as she will always be here again, Vassar girl, Katie Gibbs girl, a ghost, a ghost perched on the narrow faux brass railing of the balcony, good only for the cat litter and the trash Constance is too lazy to take down, a ghost stepping out of Hansel and Gretel, shaking the dead leaves from her sweater, still confused as to what path she was meant to follow, or maybe haunting the corner with her last match. What did I miss, her mother says, after complimenting, after complimenting Constance on her presentation. Constance has folded a linen napkin, one of her mother's favorite floral ones, next to the plate, and sliced some bananas into a bowl. She has poured a glass of milk and picked a daily a daylily from the long drive. Put the flower in a silver bud vase. She wants everything nice. But as she watches her mother's handshake, holding the toast, a feeling of pity, or rather revulsion, 
reaches up to tighten its hold, to grip her throat. It's a feeling Constance knows from catching her mother alone in a padded bra and girdle. Her mother's blue-white skin, the frayed straps of her complicated undergarments. Constance is seen drying in the master bedroom, slung over the metal shower rod. So Constance does not say nothing, as she sometimes remembers, cruel, cruel child that she was, that she continued to be. Instead, she waits, fingering the, gla the grass stain on her tennis skirt, a smudge of dirt on her wrist, her animals smell rank, furious. Everything is what she says, looking back at her mother, whose green eyes, rimmed in red, stare out so hauntingly. You missed it all, she says. such a treat to sit there and listen to you read it. That was just amazing. Oh, I loved your reading oh. on The New Yorker. Oh, well. Her reading's excellent. Thank you. Your reading's better. <laughs> well, I disagree. <laughs> no, Anyways, that was great. I love your writing. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. I love your work. Yeah. All right, we'll stop. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so the idea is that we're going to have a conversation, a little bit of a conversation about the overlap of writing and acting and characters and story. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, bear with us. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm thinking that maybe we had a conversation on the telephone and Lily said something to me about, well, you tell the story, about um, mm -hmm. when you were about to begin a project yeah. and what the actor said. And it really rang true for me about how I go about um, approaching stories and writing. So yeah, okay. So began, before I began work on an acting uh, project, uh, an older actor was actually Frank Langella. Uh, before we started acting together for the first time, he stopped and he said, and he held his hand out to me, and he said, "Dear, shall we leap empty-handed into the void?" <laughs> and. Kate and I thought that was the jumping off point for, for here because there's so much to mine in that sentence. And I'm going to let Kate take over in a second, but it, we realized our processes are kind of similar in that we try to do that. Right, exactly. I mean, I, that, that really rang true for me because um, it suggests that you're writing into a void, like you're writing into... Um, uh, a, a, not an idea, but just creating a character or cre and throwing words out there, trying to find where you're going, trying to create a path. Well, or listening too, which was another thing we talked about and how Kate was talking about you really listening to your characters. Right. And letting them take you. Right, exactly. Because I don't, like for instance, the story that you read tonight, mm -hmm. um, I actually worked on that story for on and off for probably six or seven years. I know, it's kind of... No, like, it shows. Yeah. Well, and at one point, it was about 100 pages long. And um, I just whittled it down and whittled mm -hmm. it down. But, but, but when I started, I really only had this image in mind of a print that was a print of the little match girl from Hans Christian Andersen. And that story is, has always just haunted me. I mean, it's mm. such an intense story. Um, and again, jumping into the void with that, that that was it. That was the image that um, drove the story mm. and just putting one foot in front of the other, trying to make sense of why that would be hanging around. I mean, how does it work for you when you when you read a script mm -hmm. or when you start a project, creating that character. I mean, how does, so for me, I guess I was the, the image of the little match girl, but also I was, I was listening to 
a sentence go down on the page, then another sentence, and each sentence sort of informs the one that follows. I mean, it's, you know, Margaret Atwood had this great line that a story is a score for voice. And that's always really rung true for me because it's, um, it's really, I'm just following a voice. Mm -hmm. So how does that work when you're reading a script? I mean, is that what you're looking for? Or is there well, a way to relate to that? Somehow, we'll figure it out. Yeah. We'll <laughs> find a way for you. <laughs> um, well, it's, going back to that sentence, to get empty handed is hard. I mean, that in itself takes a long time. And I don't even understand what I'm doing to get empty handed before I start a project, project, which is essentially clearing out so that I can become totally empty so that there's room for that character to come in. So basically, I try to get to this neutral space of really not imposing on that character, letting her first tell me who she is. And then I can say, can I start chiming in once I, once, you know, oh, wow. she's like, now you can talk, you know, after she's made herself. So that in itself is really hard and weird and painful. Then once I'm there, I just go over the script over and over. So it's like, um, it's almost like, again, like an investigator, neutral, just over osmosis, just over and over, kind of just getting it into me. And then I might start um, saying, gosh, I can kind of relate to this. But I don't do that until I really know what is the this? What is that? Like almost as if I was an alien, like what is really going on there? And, and then we start talking and... Well, how do, you, how do you find it in the script? Is it just a line that jumps out at you and you say, okay, this is where the character is in this line? I mean, I love the, the idea. I love the idea of getting empty, like you, Lily, have to be empty, and yeah. then you approach it. Right. It's, so. the situ it's, it's the situations. I think that's what's most important for me. What is the situation? Hmm. If I know what that situation is, then I can start to bring my truth to that situation with her context. Because I have to bring me. I've tried to not, and it either doesn't work or it's, it's just, um, there's some actors that don't, that like Daniel Day-Lewis, he does something else, you know. Um, so he just becomes something, uh, right? Yeah. yeah, that's wonderful, um, right. and he's one of my favorites. But that either I would have gone into a psych ward or something else would have happened if I had tried that. <laughs> so I, I, I got to the point that I'm like, I have to bring me along because all I have is me right. and my experience. Right. But um, I've heard you say something where you're talking about, um, you talked about leaving the character. There, there's a line that you said that I actually wrote down because it was such wiping your feet at the stage door. I had never heard that expression. And then you talked about the mask and the, would you talk about that? Because I found that fascinating. Yeah, and I pro probably artists in any realm need this. Um, so there's that expression, wipe your feet at the stage door with theater. Right. With theater has a few more rituals to help the actor transition in and out of the character. Um, there's just a few of them. But, um, but I have found that I need um, help to, to you know, uh, separate me and the character. And the Greeks, they had the masks, which was to help, the, to, help the, to be heard, but was also to protect the actor from the projections of the audience was also used, I think, to protect the actor from the character. Hmm. And so, so for me, like I've been wearing wigs lately, and wigs have been a great way to take the character off and say, thank you, you're gonna stay here tonight. And I'm going home, and I will see you tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Do you actually say that to the wig? Um, so I love that, that image. Yeah, kind of. Good night. Yeah, kind, kind of. And, <laughs> yeah. and if it's a film, and some, this one hair woman I had was great, and she sort of knew we were together. We were in this together, and she yeah. was like, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. I mean, that. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can see. Um, it, it rings true in a way of with, with writing fiction because you can get to a place, particularly if you're writing in the first person, where that, you know, you're standing in the shoes of the character for a while. I mean, that's what you're doing every day when you're writing the character. But, um, 
you really, I've never tried that of saying, okay, good night to you, and now I'm gonna go back and, and be me. And with fiction, it's kind of interesting because I think, I think that often readers, and there, there's sort of the sense of, if it's the first person, then it must be you, the writer. Whatever you're writing about, that must have happened to you, you know? Um, so it's harder, I think, to make to, to pull yourself apart from that sure. character because you're read that way almost. Exactly. Right. Right. Hmm. Yeah, little rituals to help just separate from the work, I guess. Right. Yeah. Right. We need more of those. Mm -hmm. Okay. Besides, I, like, or maybe I'll drunk. wear a wig. Yeah, wear, right when you write. <laughs> <laughs> this is just my blonde day here. <laughs> um. So another question I had for you is that I know that um, you're working on, may I ask you about, because Lily's writing, um, yeah. she's working on a one-woman show. Is mm -hmm. that something you want to talk about? Sure. Okay. Well, it's been interesting. I mean, I'm not a writer, uh -huh. um, but I've been writing on this, and it's been, um, I have a lot of respect for the process. It's, um, it's intense. It's intense. And... The editing has been really interesting. Um, and just like that Beckett, that, that little to a little, the heap, the impossible heap, you know, which my husband, Nick Flynn, who's also a writer, has, you know, echoed that many times in the, in the house, um, little to a little. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I'm in that. Um, yeah. And so how do you bring your acting to your writing? Well, what's kind of cool for me is, I can act out the writing and figure out if it's not working. Oh gosh, that would be so. That's, that's kind of nice. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sometimes I read to my, you know, I read out loud. Yeah. And it's a little embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. In fact, it's a lot embarrassing. But I bet it helps, though, right? It does help. It does help. But um, it would help so much more if I actually had your skills. I think to actually <laughs> <Right. yeah. laughs> be the character. You know, I mean, I know pretty dang fast. Yeah. Oh, that's not working. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You gotta use an accent yeah. for that. <laughs> so, and also since you're writing a, a, a play. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I, I'm gonna apply to labs and get help because I need help with this. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. It's, and you write plays. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to write plays, yeah. right? It's, a, it's an interest of mine, but, um, but I find that it's, it's kind of a, a, a different animal than fiction. Um, but one of the things that attracts me to it is the whole collaborative nature of it. So, because, you know, after a while sitting in a room alone writing fiction, you get a little, you get a little nutty in the idea of getting out there and, and working with well, other... you also said, though, it can be a little overwhelming also, right? The... the, the as a writer, co collaborating, right? Absolutely. Confusing. Absolutely. It's, 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 a, it's a balance because... Um, because you're not used to taking in a lot of other opinions. That's the, that's the side of it that's, hard, that's sometimes hard to negotiate. What's I've found really exciting, the times that I've had a workshop or productions, is just the thrill of so many talented people mm -hmm. coming together. And you know, for instance, I remember with the first thing that I had a production, um, when the lighting designer came in, mm -hmm. and it just, to have someone take your work and then light it in a way that just gives it this whole other mm. dimension, mm. that's just extraordinary. Mm. That's magical. I think that's one of the reasons why I, I'm, you know, I keep trying to, mm. yeah, to get it. It's, it's yeah. pretty exciting collaborating. Yeah. Um, so another question I have for you um, is in terms of searching out character, because I'm thinking of it that way. How does that differ, because you've done so many different mediums in a way, with film and TV and, and, and plays, how is, how, what's the difference between, say, approaching a television script versus approaching a, um, you know, a, a play, a sure. theater, live? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's really not that much of a difference between TV and film. Uh -huh. We, now we know, like, TV and film actually are so, right? So it's really theater and film. And, um, you know, theater, you do it on your feet. You have a month of rehearsal, and you experiment, and you explore with other people, and you get to 
experience what's working. Film is very isolating, and you hope you've created something that will work with what everybody else has. But it's scary because you arrive the first day and it may not work. So it's, it's, it's scary. I mean, it's happened that I've been fired because whatever I came up with in my room didn't work, <laughs> you know? And it's, so it's, it's, it's nerve wracking, but, um, but it's exciting in another way. And then there's a technical challenge with film, which is uh, concentration. How to, if you're gonna shoot a scene for five hours and it's an emotional scene, how do you pace yourself? Um, those challenges I find really interesting. Mm -hmm. And for, for theater, it's sort of like a marathon. Theater is hard. Oh, I feel I like I bench imagine. like 2,000 pounds. Yeah. I feel like yeah. I can do anything after a play. <laughs> like, and that in itself is eight shows a week. It just, it's a whole other level. Right. Right. That's sort of the rough summary. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that's interesting. What what character have you played that you're most um, that was most challenging for you? Well, for film, it would probably be Valerie Solanas for I Shot Under Warhol, and for for theater, it was probably Lemon from Aunt Dan and Lemon, Wally Shawn's Aunt Dan and Lemon. Challenging because it was the most different. I mean, with I shot Andy Warhol. One with paranoid hope. schizophrenia. Yeah, well, one with yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's always something you can tap into, right? <laughs> yeah, and Lemon. I don't know if you're familiar with that play by Wally Shawn, the Aunt Dan and Lemon, but she starts out really excited to tell this story, and she seems sweet and innocent, and it, she's actually wants to talk about Nazis at the end, and she has some really interesting ideas that she thinks everybody should should hear about so she has a 20 minute monologue and people were very people were very upset and um so that was that was that was hard very hard yeah mm -hmm. but Wally Shawn loves stirring things up so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. well that's what makes theater interesting exactly. right yeah. exactly yeah. um so should we do questions? Yeah, from, why not? Yeah. I feel like I, I wish I'd come up with some questions for you. Well, that's well. You, we have our written. Okay, we, we have got our the readers. Written. Okay. Oh yes, we have. Uh, we have a question from Virginia. Yes, we do. Okay. <laughs> not well. So, <laughs> so Scribner had. Um, I don't exactly know how they did it, but on social media. You know that thing. Um, they solicited questions. So there's some questions that now Lily will I can ask, ask that come from, from people who don't live in New York City. How do you begin creating a character from the, uh, who cares? We'll just say yeah, the question, yeah, right. we don't have to go yeah. to that. How do you begin creating a character <laughs> from California? Yes, yeah. oh, okay, good. Okay. Um, well, California. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, you know, it gets back to that notion of voice, and um, stories always start with, for me, either with an image, like I was describing with um, To Do, or just a line. Um, and it just seems to be this voice out of the blue. I mean, the line is sometimes something that's kind of sifted down from um, something I've heard something that is quirky in a way that sort of seems to contain a secret, mm -hmm. you know? And that's why I was interested in what you were talking about, about like saying goodbye to your character, having this distance from the character, because I feel as if I have that, I need to have that distance um, for, for the voice to suck me in, mm -hmm. because I don't, if I didn't have that distance, then I would know too much. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the character, the, the voice um, immediately suggests something I don't understand, mm -hmm. which is kind of strange to say because it's coming from me, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, and so um, talking like that, sometimes you get, you know, people look at you like you have six heads because you say, you know, well, like for instance, with my last book, his favorites. I mean, the the narrator. It was in the first person, and the, the narrator, Joe, um, really just kind of came on and grabbed me by the throat. And and um, I wrote that book fairly quickly. And I even thought after I had written it 
that I was going to, in this sense, kind of schmaltzy now, but I was going to dedicate it to Joe. Mm. Um, I didn't do that. <laughs> it's probably a good idea I didn't do that. But I felt, mm. I think it was the closest that I felt mm. to what you're describing about you know, this kind of um, relationship mm. with a character. And I was, I was sad for the book to end and to kind of leave her. Um, and I felt sort of protective of her. So she felt very much like um, a character that I had created, but one who I had to get to know mm -hmm. by writing the story. Mm. Um, so that's how that. Right, because you don't predetermine it. So I'm not, because I don't know what's going to happen. Right. So she's telling me the story. Um, you Which know. It's really hard to do. I mean, we were talking about that on that phone, and I was right. just so. Kate really goes into the unknown. And that's very hard to do, to keep following that. It's, 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 it's reckless it, in this way, you know? Um, and if you really sit back and think about it, it's, it's a little stupid. <laughs> to yeah, do. but I also I mean, in the sense like that like, you think, like, OK, I could have just spent three months diving into this unknown and, and not have anything to show for it. So mm -hmm. you have to kind of trick yourself into thinking, no, this this, you always have to think, this will, my mind will make sense of this. Mm -hmm. This will turn into something that feels whole, that feels like a fictional world. Or, or I will be rewarded by knowing why this character is telling the story in the way that she is telling the story. Mm -hmm. um, That's nice. I, I, I'd like to have that little tool there. Yeah. That yeah. trick. Well. Yeah. <laughs> you put it on an index card um, and yeah, just I'm remind that. yourself. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like the fake it till you make it or just. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's a good one. Yeah. Because you can't think too much about it. If you start really thinking, well, wait a second. Where am I going here? How am I going to pull this together? What's this really all about? Then it's you slip off that um, tight wire. Totally. You know, it's funny. I'm remembering a story where I, whenever I'm doing a play, like, Right before we get into the theater, like way into rehearsals, I'm kind of like, what are we doing? What are we, what am I doing? And I was talking to Nick. I was like, I, I don't know what this, what are we doing? What is this play? What? And he's like, Did, do you think David Bowie, when he was doing Ziggy Stardust, was like, what's this? What am I doing? What am I doing? <laughs> Probably not. I was like, yes, that's right. Just don't even ask. Just keep plunging ahead. Just don't worry. <laughs> Well, I've always heard from actors um, with plays that it's constantly, like every night. You, you talk about doing an eight date, which I just, oh, that's, I just it have, shouldn't be. It, that's bad. I bow it to that. Be, I, thank you. I bow to that. It should be outlawed. But, um, <laughs> but, I've always heard that you know every performance, it, it's been described to me as you're learning something new, and I, I find that fascinating. So it, I love that about theater, that it's not static. I oh. mean, this is, you know, I've written these stories, and they're here. Yeah. You know, mistakes and all. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Scribner. Or Scribner. No. Anyway, um, <laughs> here they are. And that's it. But, but with a play, oh. you know, you just, and, and, and it's just been described as you're just deepening the character, or that you, who you're, you know, who you're in conversation with on stage does something a little bit different, and then that suddenly makes you see something different about oh, the character. It's, I think it's that's... an acid trip. It really is. Yeah. It is. It is. <laughs> it, the David whole Bowie. thing is just wild. I love it. I mean, just that, like, the audience, what the hell is happening here? We're all pretending they're there. I, OK, wow. I'm in the moment, but I'm not. I'm, whoa, what's happening? I love it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yes, are we? Are you coming to say something to us? Let's take some questions from the audience. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, we can always go back to Virginia. Yeah, we can always. I have two questions. Um, number one, do you both love black? Because you both look very nice, but you're both wearing black. <laughs> Pink. Pink. Right. Well, we had to match the <laughs> lanyards. Yeah. And um, number two is uh, John Grisham. Um, I don't know if you're a John Grisham fan. I'm not, but I did love the firm. But um, he has these rules for writing, and they sound completely opposite to yours and everything you're saying, which is jump into the void, 
you know, you don't know where your character is going. You don't know what your character is going to say. And he ha is the absolute opposite that, you know, make sure that you know exactly where your book is going to end before you even pick up your pen. And I thought that you might want to opine a little bit on, <laughs> on that. Because <laughs> he's very much, you know, don't know where you're going. You right. know, have your map and right. all of that. Anyway, I'm thinking maybe I should start following his rules because he sells many more books than I do. <laughs> um, well, you know, ev you know, everybody has their has whatever it is that their trick. Um, I've just found that I can't. My mind doesn't work that way. You know, I I could sit down and write an outline or try to write an outline, and I wouldn't be able to come up with anything interesting. I mean, I can't. I can't. I, I can't imagine coming up with a plot beyond, you know, I don't know, boy meets girl, and they go, you know, I just can't, my mind doesn't work that way. Um, it goes much more to the tangible, to the, the detail or the object or, you know, what a, the, um, just what, what I'm seeing in the moment of writing and for me um, and what I'm hearing. And, so for me, that's what keeps it alive and interesting. I think that maybe if you write from an outline or if you figure everything else, if you figure things out like that, um, then, then, then you've, you've got more of a mind that just has the puzzle and wants to figure out the puzzle and put the puzzle down and then, then can articulate it. But it's just not the way I've ever been able to approach it because if I know what it's about, then I'm not interested in it anymore. I mean, I'm really writing. I mean, I've heard people say that they write, to, they write um, like to a book to that they would want to read, or that, and it's not it's not that. It's more I write um, to kind of figure out. For me, the puzzle is, you know, why is this image here? Why is this hanging around in my mind? You know, what is it about the little match girl? print that's interesting to me? Uh, and how long can I push it writing about this until I stumble on another word or line or image that's interesting to me? And that's what keeps it fresh. If I knew where it was going, then, then it wouldn't be as interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said at one point that uh, you'd, you'd uh, been working on it for a long time, and at one point it was a hundred pages long. Mm -hmm. How did you know um, that instead of turning it into a novel, say, for example, uh, instead it was you wanted to pare it back, scale it back, and make it into a short story? Well, that's a good question. Um, did everybody hear that? How did I know I wanted to scale it back? Um, uh, what, what happened was I just kept writing and writing and writing, as I've, I've described my process, and um, it, it, it became too diluted. Even though I had a lot of pages, they didn't have the urgency, um, and that's one of the ways I can describe it. And you maybe, you know, um, it, started to I, 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 it started to become too known somehow. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, there wasn't a pressure there. And I went away from it for a while and came back. And I always liked um, the idea of, the, <laughs> I love the monogamous swan. Sorry, I just mm -hmm. liked that when I wrote that line. I was like, oh, monogamous swans, I like that. And that one paragraph where um, Constance is imagining herself as, you know, Juliet, she was going to solve everything. She was going to, be different. She wasn't going to be her mother. Um, and so I knew that the meat of the story was there. And when I went back to it, I just shaved off really half of it at that point um, and went back to that paragraph and tried to sort of reimagine my way of making sense of that paragraph. Um, and it, it, it took a long time to get to the last line. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, I don't think, I think the last line for me uh, secured the story in a way that if I hadn't gotten to that last line, I don't, I don't think that 
I don't think it would have worked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it took a long time to get to that last mm -hmm. line. I didn't, I, to understand that's what she was, that's why she was talking about her mother and telling these stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Time for two more. Really, <clears throat> really fascinated by this idea that Lily, you describe of emptying yourself to let this, your character come forward. And I think similarly, like Kate describing this idea of letting your character speak, it's emptying yourself in a similar way. Is there, is there something like personality trait you have or some like that enables you to do that or some, I don't know, skill that you've developed? I'm just curious, like what enables you both to be able to do that? Yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Was that for, Kate, I think it's for both of us. How to how to how to empty how do you empty yeah. yourself? I think the capacity to suffer, you know, um, in some ways, and um, to kind of hold, be able to hold that tension, which probably comes with age, in some ways. Like I can probably handle more now than I could ten years ago, even or twenty years ago, you know. But then maybe I was I was like reckless in a way in my twenties. I don't know, it's weird, but um, I kind of lost something that I had in my 20s, which was sort of this sort of bravado or something, or this sort of, that thing you have in your 20s, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like, everyone has, everyone has that thing in their 20s. <laughs> and it manifested with yeah. my acting more. I wasn't as insecure, blah, blah, and it's sort of like, something shifted, but I know there's been a deepening that's happened with age, for sure, just experience. So just the doing of, of it, and I guess, I keep going back to listening, that listening is, is a way in for me. So the emptying out, and the good thing about listening is that it is a skill. So you can keep practicing it. And so just that, that getting quiet and listening can usually get me, get me somewhere. Yeah, that's, 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 that's interesting. Because I feel similarly, um, it's practice in, in a lot of ways. I think it's just practice. Um, and it, it's um, practice of being in a place where you can, you can listen, where you can um, focus in a way. I mean, you know, I'm sure you've heard it said that it's just a muscle. Writing is almost a muscle that if I go away from it for long stretches of time, it takes me much longer to get to that place where I can just focus and, and, and write for a couple of hours. Um, and, and, you know, I've had teachers, and I think there's, there's some truth to this, who said that just sit down at 10 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock at night whenever you do it, even if you're just sitting there and doing nothing and, and just staring at a piece of paper or a blank screen or whatever, but force yourself to be there for a couple of hours. Um, I had a teacher who used to say, "Butt in the chair time." You know, you just mm -hmm. do that, and um, eventually you'll get so bored that you'll have to start writing something. You know, and <laughs> it's true. Like, how long can I butt in the chair time? Like, how long can I sit? Here? <laughs> I was really interested to hear you both talk about the ways in which you bring yourself to something. So you got you have a character that you're going to play, Lily, right? But and somehow, ultimately, even though you're emptying, going in the void, you sort of find yourself in that. I think you talked about that. And Kate, you also talked about how there's this interesting play between a first-person narrator that's kind of you, but it's not you, and how you both have these positions where you can sort of hide behind the art in that it's not you, but it kind of really is you in a way, at least the way you're playing it or the way you're writing it. I'm just wondering if it ever gets, if you get to, I was really interested to hear more about how you might be doing things as, a, as an actor that might horrify you, but you still find yourself in it. And you might be doing things as a writer that might scare you or feel really weird, but it's still coming from within you and how you can sort of both say, well, that's not me, but it kind of is. I don't know. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's great. Of course. Yeah. Empathy. I mean, that, that we all can, we can all imagine 
something, right? I mean, it's sort of, and, it, and it's, I think it just, it's, it's good to imagine what it must be like to be somebody else, to really imagine. And um, I, think, I think it's something we kind of need to practice in general, right. you know? And as an actor, and I'm sure as a writer too, as an actor for sure, I have to really um, imagine it and not comment on it, not wink at it, not judge it, but really, if, if I really was like this, um, and so you give it its, its weight, you know? Yeah, that's right, that's right. And, and I think sometimes I find that um, if, I'm, if I'm working on something in somewhere that I almost, as an exercise, take it to the extreme as a way of putting some drama into something. So for instance, the, the ending of the story, that line that Constance says is so cruel um, that for me, that was, that was almost like it's empathy, but it's also what if I took it to the extreme? You know, what if I did this way? I, I, you know, so, so you get those contradictions in characters. I mean, I don't know if there's something similar. There probably is with acting. Like, what's the contradiction of this character? Because it shows you, it, it helps you to understand the character. Do you know what I'm talking like about? Like the tension. Talking? Or yeah, like exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. So I have a very sweet character, let's say. What if I make her do something really nasty? What does that do? Yeah. You know, how does that inform it? Like, okay, I'm, I'm writing and I'm veering toward this. I don't really like it. It's making me uncomfortable. But what if I push it even farther? What does that do to the story? Mm -hmm. Right, that anything's possible and right. things can happen simultaneously. Like, right. it can be this and that and at the same time. Right, mm -hmm. because with the empathy, um, it, it, it sort of suggests an understanding. And sometimes I find myself writing things that I don't even really have an understand. I have to push myself because I don't really understand that action, mm. do you know? Mm. Is, it, is it understanding? I don't know, yeah. maybe. Yeah, I'm gonna look or that up Or relating to, or, or, or how do you? Or imagine, I th imagining like, because they say like a guy who tortures has right. empathy. Right. Because he can, an under, well, I guess it is understand then. He can imagine what it's like to be tortured. I see. But is that understanding it, or is that, I guess it is understanding it. If you're imagining it, you're understanding it. Right. Because I guess empathy is neutral, actually. It's a neutral thing. It's true. You yeah. have to have some way that you relate to it. Right, exactly. exactly. And that can be scary. Yeah. It's a tricky question. John. So I may not understand something, but I could relate to it. I don't know if that's getting yeah. too, like, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. a murder. I could understand a murder, but I might not relate to it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let's give them a big hand. Thank you. Oh.